Welcome back to part two. We've been talking about the mere exposure effect, and now we're going to talk about how researchers have tested various explanations of this effect. I'm going to uh, go over some of the evidence that we just reviewed very quickly before I move on. And we're going to consider in this part what this evidence about the mere exposure effect tells us about cognition. We're going to consider what kinds of cognitive processes might give rise to the mere exposure effect. As a, a foreshadowing, there's different perspectives on what the mere exposure effect means, and there's disagreements. We're going to look at uh, some accounts that propose two kinds of systems to explain this effect. And at the end, we'll consider a single system account. So just as a review, what phenomena are we talking about? We are talking about this finding from uh, right here, Kunst, Wilson, and Zients. They presented shapes very quickly to people, so quickly people couldn't see them, so they presented shapes at subliminal speeds. And they found people were unable to recognize which shapes they saw before when given a recognition test. That's recognition performance at chance. However, if the task involved a different judgment, so participants were shown one of two shapes and were asked to say which one they liked the most, when given the preference judgment task, people tended to choose the old item above chance. So this is a curious scenario where people are sensitive to information they saw before, but only if they're making a preference judgment. They're unable to explicitly recognize that they saw that thing before. How do we explain this? Okay. This phenomena has given rise to debates about processing. We're going to talk about a few different theories that have attempted to explain this effect, their tentative working hypotheses, and ideally, you know, if they're good theories, they should be clear enough to make predictions that can be evaluated and measured. The researcher Zients who found this effect, he also proposed an explanation of it. So here is Zients's two system account. He proposes two memory systems must be uh, at play. And, uh, he considers that there's just the regular memory system that we're all familiar with, at least that's in the 80s. And he also proposes a special emotional memory system. His argument was that the standard cognitive stage model was insufficient to explain the mere exposure effect. We've seen some examples of cognitive stage models when we talked about the multi-store model. Here's Zients's perspective on this. In the standard way of thinking in the 80s, uh, we have sensory input outside coming into the memory system. There's some physical encoding of the stimulus. That uh, encoding is then elaborated upon, so there's some higher order encoding of these incoming information, maybe chunking it or something like that. Eventually, there'll be some kind of cognitive representation in the, about this incoming stimulus that can be transferred to a memory store. And at this point, once you know what the thing is, according to Zients, it's after that that you'd be able to form an effective reaction and then make a judgment. So according to Zients, if you were shown two pictures of geometric shapes, and you had to make a judgment about uh, which one you like the most, the standard view of memory su suggests you have to do all of these things before you can make the judgment about preference. 
And he suggests that model must be wrong because um, in his task, people are able to make a preference judgment to something they barely had enough time to even register. So he suggests that there, that while there might be a kind of regular memory system that does operate this way, that there is an additional emotional memory system that is very fast and can take uh, the physical encoding of a stimulus and uh, uh, directly go into some, I'm, I'm making a little arrow coming off the top of physical encoding here. Uh, that's not being shown, and I'm suggesting that Zions's idea is that there's actually a separate system here. Information can go there very quickly, so that which allows you to form an emotional impression of of information very quickly. So this system, this picture, does not have the emotional system being drawn on there, and Zions is proposing that we need to add an emotional system. And his proposal is that emotional system would act very quickly, it would be very fast. And he suggests that he can explain his results by proposing this emotional memory system. So for example, uh, the reason people prefer the old items at above chance levels is because the emotional memory system has processed the content of the of those geometric shapes for preference information. And that all happens very quickly. However, the regular memory system uh, was unable to process the geometric shapes completely to support a recognition judgment. So remember, we've got two kinds of things we're trying to explain why people can't recognize these shapes, but they do have a preference for the old ones. And Zion, Zions is explaining that by saying, well, we need two memory systems. The recognition task is the failure to recognize items that we can explain that because uh, the regular memory system didn't have enough time to fully process the stimuli. And well, how can we explain the fact that people like the things, uh, like the old items more than the new items, even though they didn't see them? And Zions suggests, well, we'll have to hypothesize the existence of another memory system that is very fast and only codes emotional information. So we found a result that implied there was two different kinds of systems, and he proposed that there was these two different kinds of systems to explain the result. And one thing I'm going to just put in the back of your head is do we need to do that? Can we potentially explain his finding without assuming that there's these two kinds of memory systems? And how, how, what would that explanation look like? So as a summary, Zions' two-system idea explains the pattern of results showing chance recognition for performance, but above chance um, performance for the uh, preference judgment. This is for those briefly presented shapes. All right, following Zients' idea, uh, researchers came up with another two-system account that's uh, slightly different. This one does not propose the existence of, an, uh, of a special emotional memory system. That's a bit of an extreme hypothesis in many cases, or sorry, in many cases. In, in many ways, it, uh, it is an extreme kind of move to say, well, I found this funny result, so therefore a whole different kind of memory system must exist that nobody's talking about. In, in this example, researchers propose that a distinction in the memory literature between familiarity-based processing and recollective-based processing might explain the difference in Zions' task. So for example, familiarity-based processing is the idea that uh, memory judgments can rely on 
implicit knowledge or gut feelings or feelings of fluency or feelings of familiarity. Um, for example, have you ever been somewhere and just felt like, hey, this that person seems familiar to me. Maybe I know them. I, don't I know you from somewhere? I'm not sure where exactly. So in those situations, what's going on? You're having a feeling of familiarity, but you can't quite recollect the details of why you're having this feeling. But nevertheless, you're having a feeling. In contrast, recollective based processing is assumed to rely on explicit memories. And these are the kind of memories that you can talk about. You can make declarations about the who, what, when, and where of what happened in those memories. So you've probably been in other situations where you see somebody that you know, and you can even remember the first time you met them. And you could explain your feeling of familiarity for that person. And be, because you can uh, remember all of the details about your prior experiences with that person. We're going to take a one detour for one slide here and talk about the fluency heuristic. If we go back one, I've listed that under familiarity based processing. If you want to learn more about the fluency heuristic, go ahead and click this link and uh, read that paper called Remembering by the Seat of Your Pants that uh, I mentioned in the first part here. I'm just going to briefly define the fluency heuristic. This is the idea, uh, it's kind of a two-part idea. First of all, some cognitive operations are experienced as easier or more fluent than others. For example, uh, I don't know what you think about the font of the words on this slide, but I think it's all right. I think it's pretty easy to read these words. And so let's say the experience of reading words in this font is pretty fluent. I could probably find a font that you wouldn't like, or maybe you don't like this one. And we could make the words harder to read. And that would make the experience of processing those words disfluent. All right. Research into memory has shown that people's feelings of familiarity can be influenced by processing fluency. It's kind of a bias. For example, you might think you saw a word before because it is easy to read and not because you saw it before. This would be a kind of misattribution. If I was to show you, say, a word and present it in a really nice, easy to read font, you'd look at that word and you'd have a feeling uh, of, oh, that was pretty easy to read. Now, you might not be noticing this feeling or thinking about it, but it would just be something that's happening to you, the ease of processing that word. If I then asked a question, have you seen this word before? Um, you might mistake the feeling that it's easy to read for a feeling of, familiar, of general familiarity. And this could be uh, one reason why uh, you would say you saw the word before. If you were relying on a feeling of fluency uh, as a signal for whether you feel familiar for, for that word or not. So I didn't get a chance to go into lots of examples of this fluency heuristic and evidence for the fluency heuristic. Nevertheless, these researchers in 1986 were wondering whether the results of these mere exposure experiments could be interpreted from the perspective of a distinction between familiarity and recognition. So Bonanno and Stillings ran this uh, experiment here. The paper's titled Preference, Familiarity, and Recognition After Repeated Brief Exposures to Random Geometric Shapes. So they're running the same kind of experiment, presenting people with these random geometric shapes very quickly. And they're going to ask three questions. Let's take a look. So just like the previous studies, you see a bunch of geometric shapes very quickly. Now, after that, you could be given a preference task. We've shown two shapes. You have to say which one you prefer. Now, one of them you'll have seen before, and one of them will be new. 
And we already know from other results that people tend to prefer the one they saw before compared to the new one. They're also going to do the recognition test. Now this is all stuff we talked about before. So here you'd see two shapes and you have to say which one you recognize, which one was shown in the rapid stream of shapes. And we already know from previous research that people aren't very good at picking the one they actually saw before in the recognition task. They're at chance. Now these researchers add a third question. They were wondering uh, if people would have a feeling of familiarity for the old shape versus the new shape. So they also asked this question. Look at these two shapes. Which one feels more familiar to you? Slightly different than a recognition question. Which one did you see before? It's simply which one feels more familiar? They reasoned that shapes that were presented multiple times should be easier to process. Uh, there's other results from cognition, such as repetition priming, that show that the more you practice something or the more you see a stimulus, the faster you can process that thing. So maybe what's going on in the mere exposure task is that people are processing shapes that are repeated with ease. When they look at that shape, they're like, oh, it's, it's actually easy for me to see that. And uh, they might have a feeling of familiarity on the basis of the processing fluency for repeated items. Okay, so it's possible that people would find the old shapes more familiar than the new shapes, even though they don't recognize them as old versus new. Here's the data. When people were given the preference task, their choices were 66 and 63% for the old item. That's above the 50% chance. When they were given the familiarity task, so to choose which one was more familiar to them, again, they were above 50%. 63 and 63. And when they were given the recognition chan uh, task, they, their performance was a little bit lower. It was a bit mixed here. So we have 45% and 62%. One thing that's interesting about this finding is that uh, the concept of a special emotional memory system isn't uh, necessary to explain the findings. Instead, the concept of processing fluency could be uh, the explanatory variable here. When you see something a lot, uh, many times, it becomes easier to process. Things that are easy to process uh, might give rise to feelings of familiarity. And we can see that people can use that feeling of familiarity to, uh, that, and that, sorry, that people that do, they do find the old things more familiar than the new things. Let me see if I can summarize that with a, a slide. So some inferences from the study that are that, one, stimuli can be presented too briefly to support recollection. And that's one thing that's going on here. Two, repeated items are easier to process than non-repeated items. Three, the processing fluency associated with the repeated items can be mistaken for a feeling of familiarity. A final point that I guess I could make is that people seem to have limited familiarity-based access to the briefly presented information. What does that mean? Uh, I think this can be clarified by going to talk about the final paper here by Bruce Whittlesey and Price. And in this paper, Whittlesey and Price point out a, a kind of puzzle that's going on. 
The, the question they pose is, why don't people use their feeling of familiarity when they are asked to recognize which item they saw? So they're seeing these two shapes. If you ask them which one feels more familiar, they go, oh, this one. And that's also the old one. They, they tend to do that versus the new one. So we know they have a feeling of familiarity, and we know they can use it to find the old shape. Why does everything then change? If I ask a different question, if I simply say, oh, which one of these did you see before? That's the recognition test question. And now people go, I, oh, geez, I don't know. The, I'm not sure. So somehow, when you ask people to recognize which one they saw before, they're unable to use the feeling of familiarity they're getting from the repeated item. What gives? I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from the Whittlesey paper. He does a much better job of pointing out the puzzle than I will. So quote one, we agree with much of the fluency attribution account of the mere exposure effect. However, that account leaves unanswered one very important question. As was indicated earlier, various investigators have observed that rapid exposure can increase liking judgments without producing accurate recognition. Well, given that people can use the enhanced fluency of processing caused by a prior experience um, to judge the stimulus likable, why do they not use that same enhanced fluency to judge the item old? That's the big puzzle. They must be sensitive to the fluency to use it in the liking decision. And the feeling of familiarity is based on the perception of fluency. So why do people not experience a feeling of familiarity for a stimulus and claim it to be old when it is processed fluency, fluently enough to sponsor a feeling of liking? Whew. Interesting questions. I've got one more quote to read, and this is their suggestion. Before I read this suggestion, I'm going to, or do I have three quotes even? No, just two. Um, I'm going to point out that Whittlesey and Price are thinking about the idea that the, that the funny findings here could potentially be explained by one kind of memory system and maybe not two different kinds of memory systems. So their second quote, we suggest that because the stimuli in mere exposure studies are initially unfamiliar and bear perceptual family resemblance. Remember, these stimuli are often like funny shapes. People haven't seen these before, but they are all funny shapes. So they kind of have this family resemblance structure. Uh, people given those kinds of stimuli are motivated to process items analytically for recognition judgments, but non-analytically for preference judgments. I'm going to pause here, go back to the title of the paper. So they're saying implicit explicit memory versus analytic non-analytic processing, rethinking the mere exposure effect. Previously, researchers are distinguishing between two kinds of memory systems, an implicit memory system and an explicit memory system. The implicit memory system might code information in one way, uh, for example, and the way it codes information could support familiarity judgments. The explicit memory system maybe codes information in a different way and supports things like recollection judgments. Information in the explicit memory system can, uh, could have episodic properties, allowing you to say who, what, why, when, and where of the information in, the, in those memories. The implicit memory system might have more general familiarity signals or something. The proposal, though, is that there are these two memory systems and that they have different kinds of representations in them. 
what Whittlesey and Price are doing is kind of interesting. They're, they, they are, their proposal is um, that they disagree with the need to hypothesize two completely different memory systems. Um, if you want to know more about what they're saying, I'd actually suggest go read this paper because they're proposing there's just one memory system. And for them, it's a implicit memory system that produces signals and constructs our experience. And so if you're a person who is forced to look at geometric shapes and decide which one they like or which one they saw before, the idea is the implicit memory system is uh, processing that information and giving people signals that they can use. And people evaluate those signals in forming their judgment. So it's a hypothesis that says one system constructs our experience, one memory system constructs our experience. And after that, people evaluate the nature of those internal processes. This second part here is a distinction between ways of evaluating what your memory system is doing, the distinctions between analytic and non-analytic processing. This seems a little bit abstract, but uh, hopefully we can make it concrete. So let's go back to quote two. The idea is that people are motivated to process items analytically for recognition judgments, but non-analytically for preference judgments. They suggest that the adoption of an analytic policy for recognition prevents the subjects from experiencing the fluency of processing the item as a whole, hence prevents them from the experience of feeling, uh, of, from experiencing a feeling of familiarity. Uh, if I was to try to interpret that a little bit, if I show you a bunch of things very quickly and then show you two, two possible examples. And I say, it's very important that you tell me which one you recognize from that stream of pictures. You might interpret those instructions as, okay, it's very important that I know why I'm making my choice. It's very important that I see something in the stimulus that I can, I, that I can be, have a high confidence that I definitely saw that thing. So this is an approach you might bring to the task. You might be looking at the shapes and inspecting them, kind of like with a magnifying glass, looking for explicit reasons why you saw this one and not that one. That's a way that you can do the task. It's a strategy that you can adopt while you do the task. And we'll see suggesting that when you give people instructions to recognize which item you saw before, people will be, uh, in, they will be biased or um, more likely to take this analytic strategy when they do the task. So they'll be looking for reasons why they choose this thing versus that thing. And the process of deliberately evaluating reasons why you're going to choose this one versus that one could cause you to ignore any feelings of fluency or feelings of familiarity that you're actually getting from those stimuli. So this is his hypothesis for why people might fail to recognize um, or fail to use a feeling of familiarity in a recognition judgment. Um, he also points out that when you give people a task like, hey, which one do you like more? A kind of default strategy is just to look and make a choice without thinking about it. And that could encourage what he calls non-analytic processing. If you're just looking at the stimulus and saying, oh, which one feels better? You're already in that mood to maybe be sensitive to feelings of fluency that the stimulus is providing. And if you're going to make a decision based on those signals, you could be influenced by those things. 
So how did he provide evidence for this? Basically, he conducted experiments to test the analytic versus non-analytic hypothesis. And he ran a bunch of experiments. In the first one, all the items were presented um, that were presented were from the same category of items, so all geometric shapes or all pictures of chairs or th something like that. The critical thing was that across the conditions of the experiment, they require participants to perform either the recognition or preference judgments, but they also varied the incentive to perform those judgments analytically or non-analytically. Now let's take a look at the results. Here we have the spontaneous preference results. We've got the number of times people saw an item and their preference goes up from 0 0.52, 0 0.56, 0 0.57. So if the item be presented five times, they're above chance at saying, oh, I prefer that item compared to the new item. That's what we've seen before. Spontaneous recognition. These numbers, 0 0.53, 0 0.54, 0 0.53, they're closer to chance at 0.5. Now, granted, these effects aren't very large, but people aren't doing a very good job of recognizing which item they saw before. Let's take a look at the global similarity judgment. This is a little bit like the familiarity question, but instead of the familiarity question, uh, when you see the two items, one of them's old, one of them's new, people are told to, to say, hey, which one of these is more globally similar to the things you saw before? The idea is that this question should promote a non-analytic way of doing the task. People will be more sensitive to the familiarity of the stimuli, the processing fluency, and uh, they had a higher proportion of choosing the old item. So one, one thing is to compare 1B versus 1C. You can see that people are above chance like by 0.59 for the global similarity judgment versus 0.53 for the recognition judgment. Experiment 1D and 1E are both very interesting. In these tasks, the idea was, let's see if we can tell people uh, to do a similarity judgment or a preference judgment in a way that would cause them to become analytic. So these ones are called global similarity with justification or preference with justification. So let's look at 1E for the example. You see two items, you have to say which one you like, but you have to also provide an, an explanation uh, in a written sentence. Now think about what that should do to whether you approach this task analytically or non-analytically. The justification encourages people to find a reason, uh, to think about and to list explicit reasons for their preference. And what we see in performance here is that when people uh, are asked to provide a justification, they no longer choose the old item at higher than chance rates. So the take home message here is that uh, according to Whittlesey, the analytic mode can cause people to change how they use and evaluate sources of fluency. The recognition task demands can prompt people to go into the analytic mode and quote, search for the evidence they saw in the stimulus to justify why they called this one old versus new. Preference judgments encourage people to use a non-analytic mode and rely on more general feelings. Whittlesey and Price argue that the mere exposure effects do not require different kinds of memory systems. So there's no special implicit memory system that's completely different from the explicit memory system. In, in their view, there's just one implicit memory system. 
and how people use signals from that system uh, change. That is, the results in the, in the tasks we were looking at reflect not the use of two different memory systems, but how task demands encourage people to rely on different sources of evidence while making decisions. Okay, that's it for our lecture on implicit influences and the mere exposure effect. What's up next is take the quiz and complete any additional assignments for this module. Following this module, we have midterm, the second midterm in the course, and I will release all the information that we need for the midterm on Blackboard. And then it's spring break. So enjoy the spring break and we'll see you when you get back.